Okay, well, hello again, everybody. What is the singularity? It's an idea. Uh, it's the supposed point at which artificial intelligence will not only reach but actually surpass human intelligence and thereby become able to make itself even better. Uh, and the idea is that after that time, most of the science, certainly the exciting science, will be done by AI, uh, much of the art will be done by AI, and the problems of uh, not only medicine, but government, international politics, anything really, uh, will be taken over, certainly helped, perhaps taken over by AI. Now, this is a hugely uh, controversial idea. Um, people disagree very much about whether it could happen. They disagree about whether it will happen. They disagree, as you've just heard uh, in the question time, about whether it might, sorry, when it might happen. And they disagree very much about whether it would be a bad or a good thing. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. Should we welcome it or should we fear it? And uh, Ray's going to kick us off. I suspect Ray's going to say that by and large we should welcome it. And perhaps the others are going to jump in and say, well, not so fast. So let's see what happens, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been accused of being an optimist before. Uh, and I guess you have to be an optimist to be an inventor and an entrepreneur. But I actually wrote extensively starting in the 1990s about the downsides. And of course, every technology back to fire has had a promise in peril, uh, fire kept us warm, cooked our food, but also burned down our houses. We have much more powerful technologies today, so the promise and peril are, are much more powerful. Uh, th recently, this was a lot of concern expressed by Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and others about the dire dangers of artificial intelligence. Uh, those dangers are real. I wrote a response really along these lines, that first of all, we need to pursue AI. We've heard a lot today about how we're diagnosing disease, curing disease, uh, cleaning up the environment, overcoming poverty with artificial intelligence. Uh, of the three uh, new information technologies that are going to transform the world, biotechnology, which I talked about, reprogramming the ancient software in our bodies, nanotechnology, reprogramming materials, and artificial intelligence, the one that's actually an existential risk already is biotechnology. The same technologies we're using to program biology away from cancer and disease could also be used by bioterrorists to create a new super weapon. So this was recognized a couple of decades ago. The, the industry and the field uh, developed the so-called Asilomar guidelines. Uh, we're now actually seeing the benefits of biotechnology. They're beginning to trickle out. This will be a flood over the next decade. So far, we've seen no dangers. Uh, as uh, Max pointed out at dinner last night, that doesn't mean we can cross it off our concern list. Uh, it, was, it was pointed out at dinner that these Asilomar guidelines are, well, one side of the table said they're already obsolete, another part of the table said, well, they're about to be obsolete, but that's always the case. We have to recreate these ethical standards and these technology defense systems. Uh, that's actually the biggest challenge of the 21st century, is how do we reap the promise, which I think we have a moral imperative to do, because there's still a lot of suffering in the world, while we control the peril. Uh, the Asilomar guidelines have worked so far. Uh, it's a good uh, blueprint for how we can keep AI safe. Uh, but we're going to have to continually reconsider them. And I agree with Max that we need to actually talk about this now, even though the existential dangers are still off in the future. Max, do you want to hit on that? Or Stuart? Sure. Do you want to go first? Um, so I think it's worth uh, expanding a little further on why uh, one might think that, that better machines would be a problem. So what exactly is the fear of the singularity? Uh, and if you open a newspaper uh, and just page through it until you find a picture of Terminator robots taking over the world uh, and then read that article, the, the journalist story is usually that somehow machines will spontaneously wake up and you know, they'll be in a bad mood because they just woke up uh, and they'll hate the human race and they'll try to kill us all. Um, <laughs> And they'll, they'll be armed, uh, obviously, because we just go around arming our computers. My laptop has a machine gun. Um, so it's not going to happen like that. Um, the, the process 
is going to be a little bit like uh, what happens when, when you rub the lamp and the genie comes out. Uh, and the genie grants you three wishes. And it's very, very difficult to state the first two wishes in exactly the right way. And in all of these stories, uh, and the story of King Midas as well, uh, you ask for something and then you realize that you haven't asked for it quite right. And the third wish is always, you know, please can you undo the first two wishes because I didn't quite say them right. Uh, in the case of King Midas, it was too late. He died of starvation and thirst because everything he tried to eat and drink turned into gold. Uh, and so it was irreversible. And the, the issue that uh, goes, has been raised um, for many years, going back at least to Norbert Wiener, the famous control theorist in 1960, if you put a purpose into a machine, uh, and that machine is capable enough that it's going to be hard to reverse uh, that decision, then you better be sure that the purpose is exactly the purpose that you desire. And at the moment, we don't know how to do that. So it's a technological problem uh, in much the same way that the, the containment of nuclear fusion is a technological problem. And fusion is a source of unlimited energy that, that could save our environment and perhaps even save our race. Um, but it's not useful until it's contained. And I think artificial intelligence may have some of the same characteristics. Yeah, so the question that, that was posed to us here was, should we welcome the singularity or should we fear it? And I, I agree with both Ray and Stuart in saying we should welcome it and fear it. We should welcome it because every single thing that we love, that I love about civilization is a product of intelligence. And obviously if we can amplify our intelligence thanks to machines, we can create a much more wonderful future. At the same time we should fear it because only if we fear it are we actually going to take the right precautions and get things right. This is going to be the most powerful technology ever. We don't want to just bumble into it unprepared. That would be ridiculous. And I, I think you said something very wise there, Ray, when you, when you mentioned fire. You know, in the past, all, we've found all technologies to be double-edged swords, of course, to give us new ways of doing good and new ways of messing up. But we've always used a strategy in the past of learning from mistakes. That's what must change. We learn from mistake with fire. We screwed up a bunch of times and now there's a fire exit there and a fire extinguisher over there and things are fine. But with, nu with more powerful tech like nuclear weapons, synthetic biology and AI, we do not want to learn from mistakes. We want to get things right the first time because it's perhaps the only time we'll have. And that's why I think it's so valuable to get away from this thing about, oh, Let's whine about whether we should be, how worried we should be, and ask what concrete things can we do now to prepare? These are they're exciting and challenging research questions that we don't know the answer to yet, and we want to know the answer to them. So I, I feel that to, to, to be able to welcome this and feel really optimistic and excited about the future, which I do, we need to win this race between the growing power of the technology of AI and the growing wisdom with which we manage it. And so far, it's very natural that the investments have been mainly into just making the thing work. That's the natural thing to do before there is much impact on society. But now is the time to also invest in the other kind of research, developing the wisdom, figuring out how we can create not pure, undirected intelligence, as you said in your nice nuclear metaphor, but beneficial artificial intelligence. I, I make, make some <clears throat> more specific comments here. I follow what Max just said. I think before we worry about should we fear, should we welcome singularity or the AI technology, let's just be a little bit specific. You know, what do we really mean by AI? What are those things we already developed and we believe in the next five to 50 years we will be able to do? There are a few things that we generally say they actually are about AI. There's this speech, there's computer vision, there's natural language, and we also talk about robots. But the one thing we don't talk too much is actually the general intelligence, the general understanding of what's going on. It's just a very, very difficult to, to talk about, you know, did I say something wrong or some this kind of general questions. I didn't read the speech for many years. You definitely would agree with me. I think we are only about a few years to several years away that the computer speech recognition error rate will match human level. We're talking about only a few years out. If you look at the computer vision, you know, visual recognition, we also talk about probably somewhere several years to a couple of 
tens of years. We actually, for certain limited areas, like if you have only 10,000s of categories of objects, you know, computers today can almost do as well, if not slightly better than human. Now, if you look, talk about the natural language, we're still far away from really understanding the natural language. We still have problems translating languages you know, from Swedish to English or to Chinese. Robots are particularly interesting. Now, if you look at you know, robots, you know, it's still you know, talked about, you, know, you watch the movies, the science fiction, so you have robots running around, shoot at us. I think that's probably where we have most of the fear. I think that, to me, is not really justified today you know, as we think about this. What we really need is actually you know, spending more, investing more, and then developing better and better AI technologies right now. Well, let me follow up on the comment about movies, because I think a lot of the fear of AI comes from the typical future dystopian movie, where it's the AI versus the humans, or there's two groups of humans fighting for control over the AI. Uh, we don't have one or two AIs, such as they are today. We have two or three billion of them. Uh, projections are we'll have six billion smartphones, which are AIs circuit today uh, in the world. They're deeply integrated with us. We use them constantly. They're going to become even more intimately integrated in the future. The primary application is going to be humans and machines working in very close concert together. So for one thing, I think keeping AI safe, we need to keep humans safe. And one of the reasons we're uh, distrustful of AI is because we're distrustful of humans when we look at human history. But I mean, that's the vi my vision, is it's going to be a very deeply integrated society. We're already a human technological society. Can I put in a question that's coming actually from one of the online audience? They say, how will AI be able to cope with the current lack of development of our ethical and moral norms? How do you put that in? I think that's a, that's a great question. So <laughs> one of the approaches that uh, may be able to eliminate the risk from, uh, from superintelligent AI uh, is that the machines have to come to understand what human values are. Uh, and they have to learn that, for example, if you ask them to cure cancer, uh, a good solution to the problem of cancer is not to, uh, to wipe out the human race and then there won't be any cancer anymore. Right. That's not quite what we meant to, to eliminating cancer. Um, you know, eliminating human suffering, you know, you might say, well, you know, humans are always going to suffer because that's just the way they are. So we have to, you know, I, I have to eliminate human suffering, so I have to eliminate humans. Uh, so machines have to understand our values, you know, more, more parochially in a very, very uh, foreseeable future when we have domestic robots and self-driving cars, they have to be able to make value judgments and understand the things we care about. So a domestic robot that um, is supposed to be preparing dinner for the kids uh, before the parents get home and there's nothing in the fridge, we don't want the robot to cook the cat for dinner, uh, not understanding that, that the cat is a very valuable part of the family. Uh, it's, it's certainly a cheap source of meat, but it's not quite the right one. Um, so if a... Um, if a machine makes a mistake like that, if a domestic robot does that, uh, you can only imagine what the newspapers will say. And you can only imagine the reaction of people who might have been considering buying one of those robots. There's no way I would have a robot in my house that was capable of doing something like that. Uh, so it would wipe out the industry overnight. There's an enormously strong economic incentive for companies that are building AI to take these questions very seriously, because otherwise, uh, any company, any startup company that, uh, that doesn't pay attention to this could, could ruin it for everybody else. So they're going to have to figure out how to make machines behave ethically, uh, avoid doing things, even if they're told to do something uh, by their human master. They have to know what's right and wrong uh, so that they don't do something uh, catastrophic. I, I would throw yeah, into the discussion here that human society is getting more ethical. The number of democracies we had 100 years ago, you could count on the fingers of one hand. I was certainly not every nation is a perfect democracy, but we've definitely moved dramatically in that direction. Uh, human life is very harsh and unjust. If you read writers like Thomas Hobbes, only a few centuries ago when human life expectancy was 37. Uh, better communication technology has led to more democracy. Now, people think that's surprising. Uh, 
that, uh, for example, we have the lowest rate of violence today. Uh, your chance of being killed uh, is hundreds of times less than it was a few centuries ago. Or, although Max points out if we ha ever had an incident with a nuclear war or uh, abuse of biotechnology, the, those statistics would change quickly. But we, we, are, we are making progress. Uh, the reason we don't think so is we have exponentially better information about what's wrong with the world. Yeah, yeah. this question uh, of how to have, get machines to learn human goals and values is so central to this. Because, of course, as you, Maggie, mentioned in the morning panel, one way of defining intelligence is simply how good you are at accomplishing your goals. So a chess computer is very good at winning in chess. A more general system would be very good at doing whatever its goals are. We cannot ignore the question of what goals to give the systems. And, and right now, we largely have. You know, when, when um, Andreas Lubitz flew this German wings airplane into uh, the Alps, killing all the passengers, AI could have prevented this if the flight computer had realized that there is no reasonable reason for why an airplane should be flown into a mountain. It could have just gone into safe mode and autopiloted to the airport, right? And similarly, future AI systems, we need to make them such that they can understand what humans really want, not just what they say they want, and also some basic human values. If, if you ask for it, ask your future self-driving car to take you to Landvetter Airport as fast as possible, you're going to get there chased by helicopters and covered in vomit. And you're going to be like, no, 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 this isn't what I, what, I, what I want. And your car will be like, this is exactly what you asked for. <laughs> and you know, our children learn very quickly to not take us so literally. They understand what we mean when we ask them for things. Not so literally. And the funny examples you gave with a cat are exactly in that same category. So this is, this is another, one example of a, diff, of a technical, fascinating research problem. How do you make machines able to observe human behavior, figure out what humans really want, and also what the sort of consensus is among humans about what's a good thing? Yeah, and, and, the, and the important uh, ethical question, I think, with the AI technology today, we must address is really about the data is really about the data privacy and the user privacy related to all the data we have. The reason we actually have a lot of AI today, a large reason is because we now can collect a lot more data. It's not only just about your own data, it's actually about the data from so many people, so many you know, human AI systems that we actually have today. The reason we have intelligence better today is because we have this collective intelligence that we are able to learn from each other. With all this kind of power, with this kind of data, now we have to be very careful as we design what kind of systems we have. And related to that is what I actually call the emotional AI. When you design the AI system, you actually have to take yeah. care of that. Okay, well, there's a lot of thought there. A lot of thought there going on and will be going on and must be going on from you youngsters, especially in the audience. We're going to be living with this stuff throughout your lives and your children too. There really is, are a lot of very important and very difficult issues to think about. So thank you ever so much to the panel for raising many of them. Thank you. Thanks.